warm welcome to our featured speaker, Dr. Mordecai Kadar, an Israeli scholar specializing in Islamic ideology and movements, the political discourse of Arab countries, the Arab mass media, and the Syrian domestic arena. He lectures at Bar Ilan University, where he is director of the newly established Center for the Study of the Middle East and Islam. Dr. Kedar also served for 25 years in, in the IDF military intelligence. Please uh, join me in welcoming Mordecai to Dark A. Noam. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Levin. And thanks very much to Mr. Kamanetsky for arranging this evening. I would like also to thank uh, Renana and Joe Gemino. I saw Joe, I didn't see Renana. She's here. She's here. She's here. Hi. Uh, for arranging uh, four days of uh, functions in Toronto. Uh, and many others who take part in bringing me and taking me and hosting me and feeding me <laughs> and uh, taking care of uh, uh, everything which is needed in this. Uh, Nice, sunny, <laughs> warm, warm, warm town, city. Uh, when we uh, try to understand what happened to almost a million uh, Jewish refugees who came to Eretz Israel from Arab or Arabic speaking countries. Uh, I'll get to this subject, but uh, this issue cannot be uh, detached from a large uh, subject of, I would say, the reconstruction of the Jewish mindset, I would say even mentality, in Eretz Israel as it started already at the last quarter of the 19th century. The state was established in 1948, when the process was already uh, uh, some dozens of years uh, in the make. So it, it didn't start in 1948, what I'm going to speak about. This is why. The Declaration of Independence, which was in 1948, uh, from a soci soci sociology point of view, was not an important uh, uh, event, uh, unlike what people uh, tend to think. Uh, if you read uh, sociologists who, like, uh, uh, many who, who, deal, who dealt with the, uh, that uh, era, definitely point a totally different uh, event as the beginning of the established uh, uh, Jewish being in Eretz Israel, which is 1920, almost 30 years prior to the Declaration of Independence. This was the, this was the establishing of the Histadrut. Not because they are uh, tending to the left or something like this, but because the Histadrut was the beginning of many other things, like Korah Hamagel, the defensive, defensive force, which later became the Haganah, which later became the IDF. So the beginning was in 1920. The organized labor uh, organizations, which came out from the Eastern Road, started in 1920. So this was actually the beginning of the organized activity, political activity, public activity, uh, security activity, building activity, um, industrial activity, which all began in 1920 when the uh, uh, Formerly, in, in 1882, already, uh, was the establishing of Petah Tikva, the first uh, Jewish town which was established in the modern times in Eretz Israel. And uh, 1882 means uh, almost 60, more than 60 years before the Declaration of Independence. And Rehovot uh, and Netanya and Rishon uh, Etzion and Roshpina in the north. In Haria, even, even uh, Tel Aviv was established in 1909. Means 40 years before the country, before the state was declared. 
Tel Aviv. So definitely the beginning of Israel was not in 1948. The Declaration of Independence was, yes, okay, because this was the date when the, uh, officially the uh, British mandate was finished, okay. But processes uh, of, of how to build the, the society, society building, mind building, uh, ethos, uh, uh, national ethos, um, music, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this, started dozens of years prior to 1948. So this we have to be, to be reminded because everything which I'll say today about the Jewish refugees actually connected not to the Declaration of Independence but to that era which preceded the, as the Declaration of Independence. It's just for, as the beginning of the preamble to uh, uh, what I, I, I relate more or less to, to that era uh, rather than uh, the, the, the state, but also with the state time. The main goal of the Zionist movement was apparently to take Jews out of exile. It is not easy, especially in those days, when the British, since uh, the 20s, uh, were not enthusiastic, to say the least, to allow Jews to, um, em to emigrate into uh, the land of Israel in big masses, the, the white paper and all those things, uh, the, Arabic, the Arab opposition. So the mere bringing the Jews to Eretz Israel was a hard job. Ships, which not uh, always legally came to this uh, to part of the, of the, of the world, uh, people who witnessed hardships during the way. So bringing the Jews to Eretz Israel was a hard <coughs> job, very, very difficult job. But this was the easy job. The harder job was to make them all into one nation, into one people. They came from everywhere in the world, America, South America, Europe, especially after the ashes of the Second World War, but even before uh, the beginning, you know, Zionism started after uh, the Kishinev uh, uh, riots in, also in the 80s of the 19th century. And uh, from the Arab world, from, from um, uh, even North, North Africa and, and, the, and the Mashrek means the, the Eastern Arab world, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, all these places, India, Jews came from, came from all over the world. Different languages, they found the hardship to talk to each other. Not everyone spoke Hebrew, because not everybody know, knew how to dig in the Gemara. Uh, different languages, different cultures, different looks, different habits, different foods, different clothing, different traditions, different view. The, everything was different. This was, a, I, was I would say, a conglomerate of ethnic groups or Jewish from uh, uh, Jews from all of the, the world. Everybody brought with him. Um, a suitcase of uh, culture which he came from, came with <coughs> from wherever he came. The task or the mission to turn them all into one nation was harder, much harder than the mere bringing them to the place. Look, it's even today. Uh, if you want to go to Israel, you take an airplane from from uh, uh, the airport, it takes what, 12 hours? And you are in Israel. That's it. And you are there. If, in another half hour, you are a citizen. If you go to the, <laughs> to the representative of the Ministry of uh, Interior in Lod Airport. Okay. But how, how long will it take you to become an Israeli? To drive like an Israeli? <laughs> it's, a, it's a cultural shock. <laughs> To, to speak Hebrew, without an accent. <laughs> My wife is there for 42 years. She's still with the Bostonian accent. She still parks her car in Harvard Yard. <laughs> <laughs> to change the mindset and to be Israeli, prickly as Israelis are. So, definitely, to come to Israel is one thing, but to become to become, not to come, to become 
And Israeli, there's something even today, which, which is much easier, the whole process is much easier, with Ulpanin, with all kinds of schools, what kind of, it's, much, it's much harder to become an Israel than to, become, than to come to Israel. So just imagine what, what it was to become something else when there isn't yet something else because everybody is something else. There is no Israeli nature as, as we have today, let's say 65 years or 100 years after the whole process began. I, I would even say that the process actually succeeded because today there is an Israeli entity from the cultural point of view. Today, if you immigrate, you immigrate to something which is more or less understood. But those days, it was not yet uh, galvanized or crystallized, this uh, mindset of the Israelis. So this is why the, the mission was much harder, because you don't really know what you educate people to be. And this was part of the problems of those days. Uh, however, uh, the founding fathers of Zionism in Israel uh, knew it all. Uh, ben Gurion once uh, related to people who just come as Avak Adam, means human dust, because they are so little, because they are so you know, little people. You know, people are with, without any any uh, uh, attachments to anything, because they come all alone, they are here, unknowing their right from their left, and now we have to start to make them into something which can defend itself, go to the army, fight. When did Jews fight? When did Jews were soldiers in armies? When did you have a general in the, when did we have air force? Okay, we have some pilots in the uh, Royal Air Force in uh, the Second World War. This is not an air force. Technicians, mechanics, engineers, architects, all these things which we need in order to build a country or a state, a society. So, so this is why he uh, uh, once said, our mission is to take Avak Adam, I mean human dust, and to make, to make them into a concrete, something which can hold, something which can be a, 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 a nation. It, it is not easy to look from today to the 20, 21st century with all the media and the abilities which we have today in order to understand the hardships which those, the fight, founding fathers of the state, uh, were facing when they, when they had to solve so many problems in very short time. And with resources which, is far, which, are, which were far from uh, answering all the needs together with the war which we had not only started in 1948, uh, the, 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 the violence of, of 1936 to 1939, formerly the massacres in 1920, 1921, 1929. Okay, there was not even one decade without uh, uh, problems. And problems between the, between the big massacres, we have little massacres. Uh, here two, here three, here eight. What do you think, Kiryat Shmone and Yad Shlosha, all these names of, of uh, kibbutzim and, 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 and towns are on the name of people who were killed uh, through the years in the, the struggle to survive in this place. So in, 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 in addition to the mission to galvanize and to make everybody into one nation, we have to fight also for the survival, for, for the physical survival, physical survival. And this combined with this, you can imagine uh, what hardships were in those times. Uh, they employed everything which they could. Uh, my sister uh, today is writing her PhD on uh, analyzing the folk songs and children's songs which were uh, authored uh, at the first um, quarter of the 20th century in Israel, which were all aimed at creating the awareness of togetherness to create the awareness of a nation rather than uh, uh, um, separate people who came from all kinds of, people, of, of places. Uh, especially Hanukkah. Hanukkah was the, uh, the event, uh, Hanukkah of course, Pesach as well, uh, to signify not only the Nisim, the miracles which happened to our forefathers in Eretz Israel uh, more than 2,000 years earlier, but the Nisim which we witness today of uh, Maccabee 
you know, the, the image of uh, Judas Maccabeus actually was the, the, uh, the image of the Jew who rose to his rights and to fight against all those which actually we should be. So uh, the, 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 um, the aim was to project um, the past to, the, to, to, to these times in order to convince the people that yes, we can, just like our forefathers did it in this country. So this is why Judas Maccabeus was one of the leading figures in my, in my childhood as the role model for everybody in the land of Israel. Uh, so songs were uh, also songs in the red, you know, uh, singers were going out uh, around in the country. So the films which were made of those days, um, like eight millimeters, all those um, literature, uh, which was written those days. This was the, uh, if you read them, you analyze uh, what was there, definitely this was the mission which everybody tried in his field to take part in the nation building of that, uh, of that era. Uh, one big question was then, is what should be our, or the, the Zionist uh, attitude to exile? means to the time of exile, to the situation of, the, of exile, and to Jews in exile. This was very complicated. Because on one side, we, uh, we Israelis, or, or Zionists of those days, saw themselves as something which the antithesis of exile. As they say today, as they say, said there already, uh, we are not only about taking uh, Jews out of exile, we are about taking exile out of the Jews. Means to create new mentality, new way of thinking, that you are not anymore Romanian, or uh, Algerian, or Moroccan, or Yemenite, or American, or Canadian. You are Israeli. By the way, this is how I was brought up to present myself Israeli, although my parents came from Poland. I have known nothing with, to do with the Polish, uh, 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 not, not with the language, not with anything. Of course, my, my mother tongue was Yiddish, but we all present ourselves as Israelis, and not anymore somebody who came from Hung Hungary or Morocco or so forth. So to, to, large extent, to large extent, the definition of Israeli uh, actually replaced the definitions which Jews came with them from exile means, uh, to large extent, to erase, to erase the background of exile means to take exile out of, out of the Jews, and this actually was the the goal of the whole thing. So you are not any more lonely people, single people, or individuals who came from all these countries, but you all one nation, one people, one group who are Israelis. And this actually was the, the, the bottom line of all these uh, efforts to, to create this uh, Israelihood or Israeliness uh, rather than to continue the mentality of I came from there and he came from there. Uh, this was actually the, 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 the main goal of all these efforts which I uh, talked about. And only on this you can, in Darchei Noam, have a whole series of, uh, of lectures, how this, uh, I would say, uh, uh, human engineering, human engineering or mental engineering, uh, how it worked, what, what were the components of uh, the efforts which were put into this uh, effort, and uh, with, uh, with the, always the question, did it work or not, did it succeed or not, or to, to what extent it was successful in this field or in that field, so that definitely. And there is what, uh, much what to, uh, to talk about this, and I think this is uh, what I wanted to say about that era, and the, uh, the idea, the main idea of Zionism, and, and I would say in the first half of the uh, uh, 20th century, is this, to take the exile out of the Jews in order to shape one nation which will be able to be the basis for the state when eventually at 1948, the British mandate will fold its flag and go away. So this is, uh, uh, and this is why 
these 50 years or more uh, where uh, they go under the, man uh, under the mandate or men before the mandate uh, in order to make a nation which will be ready to continue the statehood from the same minute which the British will leave. We didn't, it means uh, the idea was not to wait until the British leave and only then start to galvanize everybody and to crystallize the society, but to start the processes much earlier in order to be ready to take the keys of the country and to continue the journey from the minute that the British driver will leave the vehicle. This was the, the idea, and I must say that to a large extent it succeeded. Because, how do I know, one day after the Declaration of, of Independence in 1948, there was the invasion of six Arab um, armies into Israel, from Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, uh, uh, um, Egypt. Egypt. And, 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 and the state was forced to fight for its, not, ex, not, not independence, existence. Because they didn't aim at taking any territories, they, they aimed at liberating Palestine entirely. The goal was to meet in Tel Aviv. Means everybody comes from every, every direction to meet in Tel Aviv, on Tel Aviv seashore, when they will uh, have the Arab flag or some other flag in the place and to get rid of this, uh, of this country one or, as fast as possible uh, in the first uh, war. And Israel with a price of uh, 6,000 uh, people who were killed, 1% of the whole Jewish population in Israel succeeded to prevail. It, it would not happen, and these are armies, you know, normal armies, with tanks, with cannons, with air force, uh, if not the process which preceded the, the state of galvanizing the people and make the Koach Magen and the Haganah and all these forces which were a part of the IDF uh, later, without this preparation of a nation uh, in the 50 or 60 years prior to the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, Israel would fail in the second day of war. How can you make a state? How can you sustain? How can you survive when six armies invade your country and uh, try to get rid of you to totally? How can you fight them if you are not, if you don't have a, a, a chain of commandment, if people uh, are not trained, if people are not equipped, if people are not armed, if people don't, do not know the goal, and if people are not educated to defend their country, their people, and their state, the new, newly, new, newly born state. So, and this doesn't happen within one day. You have to take people who came as refugees, came, came as, as, as Avak Adam, uh, no, uh, human dust, and to make an army out of them. This is something which cannot happen within even one year. It, it takes a lot of time, effort, education, and this actually was the fruit of the, 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 the fact that Israel could or succeeded to survive in the, in the independence war. It was only the, the fruit of 60 years at least of human engineering which <coughs> took place in that, in that uh, part of the world. And this is I think uh, uh, the, the main idea of, of this, what I want to say now. Now, the question of uh, refugees. In general, from Romania, just like Morocco, how the state, or the society before the state, and the state uh, related to those refugees? What was the process which they went, th went through in order to become part of the of the uh, society, and the state, and the country. <laughs> this is a little, little coll collection of uh, photos from what we call in Hebrew, Ma'abarot. Ma'abarot, uh, the name is very important. Uh, Ma'abara in Hebrew means a passage. Something which you pass through. It's not a settlement, not a farm, not a kibbutz, not a moshav, nothing. This is ma'abara. Means you are living, here, you are living in these places for time being. You are passing 
in this place on your journey to somewhere else. This is the idea behind the word Ma'abara. Of course, you can see there are tents or uh, little uh, wooden uh, huts or things like this. Nothing permanent, nothing which was supposed to be permanent. And in this Ma'abara, people, uh, you know, conducted normal life as, as they could, uh, washing their clothes and uh, maybe building here and there. And uh, of course, try to survive in the mud, Tel Yerucham, all these places. Okay, but they, they, they live there trying to build new life uh, in this place. Of course, learning how to uh, be uh, fa farmers because uh, most cases uh, Jews were not uh, uh, in farms. Uh, dancing, learning, uh, kids are everywhere. Okay, so these are actually pictures from those times where newcomers from wherever they came from, Europe, Arab countries, wherever, if they didn't have any house which they can be, uh, buy immediately, they uh, were taken to these Barbarot, which were all over the country. Look at this. Uh, Look at this one. Okay, some of them had a synagogue, a tent, tent for a synagogue, and uh, so forth. This is a, a casual uh, a collection of pictures which, uh, you know, just Google the word Ma'abarot, you'll see those, uh, those there, there were dozens all over the country, which were uh, uh, erected only to absorb big numbers of people, and I'm talking about, uh, about uh, what, two million? people who came in a span of four years uh, between, between 1948 and 1952. Uh, how can a country with, with very limited resources, uh, with hardships for us, with wars, uh, underdeveloped as it was uh, because of what the British, how the British left the country, uh, not consolidated as with a society, with Arabs society uh, as well, which we have to deal with them also, uh, how, how can uh, this country build in, in such a speed uh, houses and, build, and, and buildings and apartments? And this is impossible. Uh, this was impossible those days. This was, uh, by the way, the, the reason why we had the, uh, what we say, the kitsuv, means uh, you could buy food only with stamps. So there will be, uh, since there is a shortage, so everybody can buy only according to the number of children which he has. Okay, so I, I think you can turn the lights, the lights on. So this, this actually were actual places where people were living. Of, okay, the winter there is not like in Toronto, but definitely when we have rain, it's wet. And uh, these places were, and uh, the, mud, the mud is there and uh, life is not so easy. Uh, in, even in the, in the Israeli winter, when you have to live in a tent, without any heating, without electricity, just imagine, they didn't have electricity in this place. They had to, to light with the lanterns, with, you know, with fuel. Uh, some of them would uh, fall and burn the tent, and damages could, could very possibly be there. So definitely, uh, uh, living in such a, a tent uh, for months, and in some cases more than months, it's not easy. Uh, at all, but people, in most cases, understood that this is the this is the conditions because uh, no everybody is here. Romanians with with uh, Moroccans, people from Yemen like people from Poland, and they shared together the uh, the uh, conditions in these uh, in these ma'abarot uh, uh, as the, as they were called. A very hard time, but the idea was that this is our only ma'abarot, means a passage, something temporal, temporary in order to come to uh, uh, permanent uh, uh, housing, permanent places, uh, wherever they are, in the city or in the farm, or wherever the kibbutzim, or shabim, never mind. But definitely they were not meant to be permanent uh, places where people will live. And this is, I think, the crucial uh, uh, point to our presentation. The refugee hood of people, wherever they came from, was not meant to be a profession. <laughs> Unlike 
in other parts of the world or the Middle East. And this is, I think, is the core, the core point which I want to make clear in this evening. Whether it concerns the Jews who came from Arab world or from Europe or from wherever they came, we did not call them refugees. We call them Olim Chadashim. And there is a big difference between being a refugee and being Ole Chadash. If you are calling yourself a refugee, you mean, you mean that you are forced to leave a place, you still want to be there back because you are a refugee. You are forced to leave that place, but you originally came from something, and you are living temporarily here because you're a refugee, but what would be the solution? To go back. This is the meaning, or the, at least one of the meanings, or possible meaning, of, the, of being a refugee. Being a refugee means for, for a while, you live somewhere else because of a war, or a flood, or an earthquake, or something which prevents you from living where you are, or when you originally were. You are now a refugee in a refugee camp somewhere else, and with the time, with, after everything will be okay, you go back to the place where you, which you came from. After the flood will be cleaned, after the war will finish, or after buildings will, will be uh, built again after the earthquake. Okay? This is the meaning of being refugee, and this is actually what happens in the world uh, in, most, in most cases of refugees. So this, but, but calling these people refugees, ah, excuse me, they don't, they don't have any idea, and any meaning to go back to Poland or to Morocco. They came in order to be Israelis and to come to Israel. So, so you cannot call them refugee. You have to invent a new... Uh, now, they are not even mehagrim, means immigrants, because they didn't emigrate from one place to another place, like from Morocco to Poland or to, to Spain. Because in our mind, they come to Israel to their home, to their homeland, in order to be again a nation as they were 2000, ago, 2000 years ago when they were taken to exile by the Romans after the destruction of the, of the Second Temple. They, so, and there is no term for this. They are not, okay, so not refugees. They are not immigrants, so what are they? So this is why we say Olim. Olim, I don't, I don't think there is any popular <laughs> word in English for Olim. That's why I say we came on Aliyah. Because there is no term in English which will, uh, which will explain what it is to come to Israel after you spent 2,000 years in exile. So this is why I think, in my, in my view, there is no English term from, for Aliyah. This is why we say Aliyah, we come on Aliyah, we come on Aliyah, we are all Olim Chadashim. All olim. So, so in order not to be refugees, in order not to be Mehagrim, means immigrants, we invented this word of, of Aliyah. Means this is something totally different. You didn't come to be an, Im, an immigrant in Israel. You came to be an Israeli. Means to come on Aliyah. There's no other place. No other place to go and no other term to be. And not, not other. This is why, by, by the way, you, you become a citizen immediately when you come. No, no state in the world does. Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, Ireland. Uh, gives Irish uh, citizenship to every person who was born, wherever he was born, to Irish uh, uh, parents, immediately. Uh, there is something uh, like this in Germany also, but uh, it, uh, only a handful of, uh, of states uh, uh, does it. Uh, Israel is, I think, is uh, well known to do this. So, uh, immediately, uh, we came to, to Eretz Israel from wherever they came uh, to become uh, uh, Olim Chadashim and not refugees. So already the term refugee, we didn't use it. And when we don't use it, why should others use it? If we don't claim that we are refugees and we don't feel like refugees, and this is the issue. We don't present our refugees. We didn't make, as I say, they didn't make our, a profession out of our refugeehood. So if we don't claim that we are refugees, why should other nations uh, give us or 
thing that they have to give us, the rights of refugees. If we don't demand, and we did not, I mean, the Israeli society of those days, uh, since it didn't view itself as refugees, but as Olim, we didn't uh, come in all kinds of uh, you know, demands to the world, uh, recognize us as refugees, and treat us as refugees, compensate us as refugees, because we turned our back to those countries where people came from. Today, it might be a, a, a misunderstood or taken in a, a kind of a weird, how, how, can, how could you do this? But this was the mindset of, of uh, uh, the found father, fathers, fa founding fathers of, uh, is of Israel on those days. Let them go to hell, all these countries which we, which we came from, either in Europe or in the Arab world, we don't want from them anything, at least not at the first stage. We don't, just to leave us alone and to uh, uh, those who can support us, we will highly encourage it. Europe, America, Canada, we, we will take support as a country, but not as individuals. Because we are detached from whatever we had there, either uh, uh, private assets or uh, uh, communal assets like synagogues, uh, 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 cemeteries, yeshivot, and so, and so forth. And this was actually uh, uh, the, the attitude to all the refugees in general, especially those who came from countries which are viewed as hostile countries like the Arab countries. You could uh, maybe some, sometime come to Poland or to Romania or to other countries uh, with demands to compensate us later, as uh, was done in some cases when it came, when it came to uh, uh, um, uh, East, Europe, East European countries after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. There were demands, but this came uh, dozens of years later. But at the beginning, uh, uh, the, 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 ten the tendency was to turn the back of the country, of the state, of the population in general, to what they had and what they, what they had, especially on the personal basis. And this is another, another point which should be emphasized. When you have a, a, a communal mission, you generally or usually you put in the margin the personal problems. The problem of the, of, the, of, the, of the person. You don't deal, you don't have time for this, you don't have space for this. You deal with the big problems of us all. What do you tell me today about your house? We are now building a country, we are building the state, we are building an army, we are building a society. What, now you, now you cry about, about a, a house which you had in Marrakesh or in Poland? The country doesn't have the time and the space to deal with personal problems when you have to deal with the, sus the sustainability of the state, which you have, where you have a, a war every couple of years, and terror between the wars, and you have so many emissions to build the industry and, and the, uh, um, the air carrier like El Al and Tsim and all these big projects. Who has the gedult, you know, the, the sablanut, the uh, patience? to deal with personal problems. Because everyone had per per personal problems. Who didn't leave a house, who didn't leave a home, who didn't leave a, a something, a, a bank account or something in those countries. But if the country will deal with everybody's uh, problem, the country will not have time and space to deal with the big problems which everybody shares. This, this is why in those, in those days, in, in, in generally in Israel, the person was taken as part of a big project, not as somebody uh, with individual needs and problems. In general, not only when it came, came on to refugees or to those of newcomers. Even, look, I, remember, I still remember when, when I was recruited to the army in 1970. 1970 means, uh, what, 40 uh, something years ago. Um, a, a, a soldier who was sick uh, went to the doctor in the, in the base he gave him one day, either at, either at home or uh, in the tent or in the room or whatever, and that's it. This was the general treatment. Uh, he gave him something. Today, if the doctor doesn't uh, send us the, 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 the soldier immediately to, 
to an emergency room in a hospital, if that, immediately the parents start calling and you know, set for, and well, how, how dare you uh, 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 neglecting my kid in such a way? Oh, uh, so, so today uh, the army has to uh, uh, you know, deal much more seriously with personal problems. Those years which I still remember, and I'm not talking about the 50s and the 40s and the 30s, I'm talking about the 70s. Who knew about this? If you had a problem, you, you had a, a day in, in, in the tent, uh, you know, you were exempt from the uh, uh, training or so forth, and uh, okay, if you had a, a high temperature and you couldn't function anymore, so they will take you maybe to a hospital. But definitely, uh, the, the person, uh, even in the days which I remember, was much smaller compared to the needs of the community. Today, the needs of the person are much more prominent and being take, taken care of uh, because of new media, because of the new approach, because of personal rights and human rights, all these things, which became much more prominent to the last generation. But in those years of the 20s and 30s and 40s, who cared about the person? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to make a joke. This, this, is the situ this was the situation. Look, I don't know what the situation in Canada was. But I think that uh, it changed uh, after the Second World War mainly. Because, oh, look, uh, it, it comes also to, uh, to uh, what Israel does with uh, uh, prisoners of war. Look how much media was about one person, Gilad Shalit. In the last, uh, let's say, five years which he was, which ended uh, two years ago. How much was, you know how many, how many POWs we had in 1948, 1956, 1967? How many people were missing in those wars? And today, everybody knows about Ronara. Okay, Ronara, the pilot who, who uh, 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 fell in, captive, in captivity and later apparently died. But uh, uh, those years, who heard about them? Who knew about them? Their names are anonymous. They're anonym, an, 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 anonymous people. So. This is the change which occurred during the last, uh, let's say, generation or two generations. But in those days, the person did not get any attention because the project, the big project, today we have to take care of it. Leave us alone with your own problems. Deal with them by yourself. So this was more or less the, the message. I, I think not only in Israel, but especially when you have to build a country, to build a society, you don't uh, pay too much attention to uh, uh, personal problems of individuals. The people who came from, from, uh, from Arab-speaking countries uh, were the victims, I would say, maybe in brackets, of all these, I would say, melting pot of the Israeli society of those days, of the project to build the society. First of all, they were not called refugees. Just like people who came from Romania, who were no less refugees, uh, or those who came from the ashes of the uh, camps in Europe. They were no less the refugees, but they were not called refugees. They were not depicted as refugees. They were treated as refugees. And the state only later came with demands to Germany to compensate, but later came the personal compensations. First came the communal comp comp compensations, and uh, uh, Israel definitely uh, used the German money uh, because we needed this pumping of money, and it was, was a very big debate. Inside Israel, and it was well known it was between uh, Ben Gurion and Begin. Begin objected it. Ben Gurion was for it, not because Ben Gurion loved, loved the Germans, but he needed, we needed the money, we needed the, these resources. So, uh, so Israel, Israel unwillingly took it. Of course, on the personal basis, my mother, my mother Allah Shalom, never uh, uh, entered the cab made in Germany, even a cab. Mercedes, she would try. If she was Mercedes, she would go away uh, and she would wait for another one. Because she never liked to, to ride the German car. Okay, so on the personal, on the personal issues, uh, people still reacted as those who were uh, damaged or uh, uh, came with scar uh, from, from exile. But uh, on the communal uh, uh, level, uh, definitely Germany became one of the big supporters of the State of Israel, especially su uh, uh, financial support. Uh, as you might know, the, the Israeli shipping company, Tzim, uh, was built with the German money and uh, submarines we have from Germany and all kinds of things. Definitely, uh, Germany helped us 
And uh, yes, we, we should admit, yes, we helped the Germans wash their conscience after the Second World, World War, uh, no doubt. And it was a big sacrifice from our side not to perpetuate this uh, hatred and uh, still uh, continue life and maybe open a new uh, page in, in history. Uh, Jews from Arab countries, and here I come to the sensitive issues, uh, were viewed by the engineers of the uh, Israeli new mindset as uh, second-class people. And this, uh, yes, uh, we have to admit it. Uh, as you might know, uh, the Zionist uh, organi organization was founded by people who came from Eastern Europe, mainly from Russia. Um, Kishinev, uh, Ben Gurion, and others, uh, carrying more or less the ideas of socialism, which was also a program how to re engineer people, how to re engineer their mindset. And uh, to a large extent, Israel in those days was supposed to be a, 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 not a Soviet like, but socialist like country where the state is in charge of everything. Uh, edu education, uh, mass media, uh, public sphere, uh, arts, um, even religion, uh, was viewed all as part of the planning of the country, of the state. I think that very little number of people who sit here know what it was to be, what, what it was to live in the Soviet Union or Soviet Union uh, of, uh, of Eastern Europe. There are Jews who came here from Russia, but those who, who grew up in Western society have no idea what it is to, to live in a society which everything, every single thing is something which the government takes decisions about. Not only uh, 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 roads and uh, street lights. I'm talking about culture. The, the commissars, means the, the ideological policemen, are actually determining what opera to, to, to uh, air, or what, to, what songs will be sung in the, in the radio, and what movies will, will people see in, in, in the theater, in the cinema, uh, what um, uh, culture we have, what our language, the street names, everything is planned by the country according to the plan of the, those who are shaping our society. The uh, Zionist uh, organization was something like this. What do I mean? Uh, religious people who came were viewed as people who remained to extent in exile. Because according to the socialist uh, way of thinking, uh, religion is, uh, as was said by some in Eastern Europe, opium for the masses. Uh, I didn't invent it. Marx said it in others. Um, religion actually is something which we as new Israelis should be detached from. From the base Medrash, from the Gemara, from uh, all these things which characterize the shtetl in Eastern Europe. We are, we are rebels. And the rebellion was not only at exile, against exile, it was against the exile nature of Jews. And this is why religion, as Judaism, as was viewed by those people as the shtetl, was something which we should detach ourselves from. A Jew with a black hat and a beard and peot was viewed as some kind of exile which was implanted in Israel. Doesn't belong in here. Because we, here we are about to, to build a new society, new mindset, new religion, which will be the Israeli religion rather than the Jewish religion. Uh, you could see it very easily in Haggadot Shel Pesach, which were printed in the Kibbutzim. The real Yetziat Mitzrayim was from Europe. You know, the coming out of Egypt was actually coming out from Europe. The Kriat Yam Suf, you know, the tearing of the, of the Sea of Suf, uh, was actually coming through the Mediterranean from the, uh, from the port of Brindisi to, to Haifa. 
This was the Kriyat Yam, the modern, our Kriyat Yam Suf. And the miracles which uh, our forefathers saw in the desert were actually the miracles which we saw here uh, when we were renewing our... Which actually, the whole Judaism was reshaped in the mindset of nation building of the modern Jewish people who leaves behind his back all the uh, remnants of exile, including religion. Including, this was the main uh, way how to look at religion. Although, of course, we can take the heritage of the land, of the personalities like Judeas Maccabeus, all those, yes, these are good. But the lifestyle of Jews as it was in the European shtetl, this is something which we should abandon. This was a very important thing, especially when it came to religion, because after all, many were religious. How can you deal with it? You cannot tell them, stop praying, stop uh, stop keeping Shabbat, and the women stop going to the mikveh. You cannot tell. But what happened there is, I would say, the new building of a new Israeli religion, of new Israeli kind of, of uh, Judaism. First of all, the kippah suga, the knitted kippah, rather than the one which is made out of cloth, which resembled the, uh, another thing, I'll talk about this. Secondly, praying in Hebrew, abandoning the, all the uh, saf, means all the, uh, what we call praying in Yiddish. We don't, as, as, as I as a kid would, when I heard all those uh, Jews who came from exile and still praying, as they were praying in the, in, 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 in the shtetl, I would say, hey, they, they pray in Yiddish, not in Hebrew. Okay, so uh, uh, developing the, the Hebrew speaking or the Hebrew uh, kind of, uh, of uh, tefillot, and especially the Kriyat Torah with Sfaradi accent, which took over everybody. And today there is no Ashkenaz in the modern Orthodox synagogues. They actually are being Israelized or made into Israeli kind of of modern Orthodox, which is much more Israeli and Hebrew rather than Yiddish and preserving the the, the, the traditions. For so even within the religious sectors, which remain loyal to 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 the religion, the Orthodox Orthodox religion. Still, we introduced many uh, changes which actually uh, uh, updated the religion to be more Israeli religion rather than Jewish in the meaning of the state. So this is the revolution within preserving the, the, uh, the religion. So we did not follow those orders to stop going to shul, but we updated the shul to be an Israeli shul, so this was much more accepted by the engineers of the, of the community. Only later, in the 80s, uh, we started, people went back to the real tradition, especially in Sephardi or, or uh, within communities which came from the uh, Arab countries, <coughs> which go back in many cases, uh, especially after Shas, the, the, the party of Shas came uh, came to power, they actually uh, wanted to lehzir atara leyoshna, to bring the glory of our forefathers in the eastern uh, uh, communities back, and today you can see very easily in Israel a, a revival, or I would say the renaissance of the Sephardi uh, uh, shuls and the Marokai shuls, and you find them, uh, even youngsters who were brought up as Israelis, in some cases, I'm not, I'm not saying in all cases, but you can you can see in towns like Shderot, like uh, like uh, Ekron, like uh, uh, Ofakim, Netivot, uh, the re the renewal or the revival or renaissance, I would say, of the of the traditions of which they brought uh, from Morocco, from Iraq, from all those places, which were pushed to the margin by the by the uh, state or by the society in the 50s and the 60s. So definitely you can see. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, to demands about assets, about rights, especially right of return, nobody wants to return to Iraq 
especially today. <laughs> nobody wants to return to Morocco. Uh, nobody of, of those uh, Israelis wants to return to Tunisia or to Yemen. And, may, oh, and uh, every one of them, or almost every one of them is a mayhem, especially today. Uh, we don't demand any right of return, unlike uh, the Palestinians, for example, which is the counterpart, which is the, the other side of the meal. Um, we don't, and, and um, you know what? I, I'm not sh so sure that you, if you, even if you demand compensation on the assets which were left by all those almost million Jews, you're going to get a penny. First of all, because of the state of war between us and some states. Secondly, uh, those countries have, first of all, to compensate their own citizens because of the damages which they, which they witnessed during the last years. So anyway, those countries are in such a bad shape. Look at Iraq, look at Syria, look at, you know, now go demand something from Syria uh, today, okay? So definitely, uh, either because of the state of enmity and the uh, uh, history of enmity between us and those countries, there were no real uh, demands to compensate Jews. The only place which you could do something maybe is Morocco, because Morocco uh, um, had, uh, is, is a stable uh, society, a stable uh, kingdom, of course, and Jews are living there. Um, peacefully, and even Israelis who are not from Morocco can visit Morocco. And uh, Morocco, uh, factually, uh, is a state which you can talk to them and they will answer you. And uh, so, when it comes to Morocco, I know about a lawyer in, in New York who dealt with uh, um, demands of Moroccan Jews, especially from the United States of America, who have cases uh, of, uh, to demand their assets from Morocco. When it comes to Israel, it becomes too much to politicize, and Morocco wouldn't uh, talk much with Israel about uh, assets of Jews, which, by the way, are much more in value uh, of the, uh, compared to the uh, assets which Palestinians or others who were, were in Eretz Israel left when they left Eretz Israel to exile, to their exile, or to their refugee camps uh, in 1948. Definitely, when you compare, first of all, the numbers, more Jews came to Israel than Arabs ran away. So uh, we absorbed our refugees, if you want to call them refugees. Uh, there is no reason why the Arab countries would not uh, absorb Arab people, where Muslims, as those countries are, uh, who in many cases originally came from those countries. You know, those Palestinian refugees, many of them carry names like Al-Masri, means the Egyptian, or al-Iraqi, or al-Horani, means somebody who came from the Horan in the southern part of uh, Syria, or Tarabulsi, somebody who came from Tarablus, from Tripoli in Lebanon, uh, al-Sorani, from Tzor, uh, Tyre, in Lebanon, al-Sidawi, from Sida, Sidon, also in Lebanon, Zarqawi from Jordan, and many, many other kind of, uh, uh, towns and cities and villages which are all around the Middle East. So those Palestinians, uh, originally, many of them, majority of them, were not originally from Palestine, for what uh, Eretz Israel is, because they came to work, either in Tel Aviv or in Petah Tikva, in, just like they come today to other countries to work, looking for work. So they came, but since uh, Jews offered, uh, you know, labor in those places, they came because there were no borders. They could uh, wake up in Beirut and come, take their car or whatever, and go to uh, Rosh Pina, to work in Rosh Pina. There was a shuttle, a train, between Haifa and Beirut. So you could live in Haifa, work in Beirut. So imagine the one day hostilities start, and the train stops working, and you are stuck in Beirut, so what are you? Are you Lebanese or Palestinian? Okay, your home is in Haifa, you, you work in, in, in Beirut and you got stuck in work because the train doesn't work anymore and you cannot go back to your home in, in Haifa. So what are you? Lebanese or Palestinian? Okay, so this is actually what, what happened there. All, all of the sudden there are borders and all of there is Palestine which was not yet in those, in those days. So uh, all those all these definitions, new definitions of Syrian, Lebanese, Jordanian, Palestinian came only after 48 because former to this, everybody was Shami. Shami means 
somebody who lives in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, which today is Israel and, uh, and Jordan and uh, uh, Lebanon and Syria, all these uh, shaman people were wandering on the place according to them. Uh, work opportunities and so forth. So all of, the, all of a sudden they became Palestinians or Palestinian nationals. This is something which they newly invented. And you know, there is not even one book in the world uh, which talks about the Palestinians prior to 1925. Or a newspaper, or nothing. This is a new invention which was invented after those countries were marked by the colonialism by Sykes and uh, Picot, the British and the French. So. Uh, 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 definitely Israel has a case, has a case uh, to tell them, guys, you are Arabs, you are uh, Shamis, you are in the Arab countries, you are in the Sham, you can, how can one be a refugee in his own country? And you are in your countries, so you are not refugees. And uh, th this can be acceptable. Uh, you are within your uh, co-religionists, so, so definitely you are not in exile as... Uh, and you know what, uh, to tell you what happened, what happened with them, unfortunately, is not because they are Palestinians, but because of tribalism in the Middle East, which is alive and kicking uh, after so many years. Um, I, I'll give you just a little, little example. Uh, people ran away from the area of Hadera, for example, which is a little north of Tel Aviv. They ran away to uh, uh, Shechem, for example, to, to Nablus. And they were put in refugee camps, although they are Palestinians, so the place is Palestine. So how, what is this? Palestinians are refugees in Palestine. Or near, uh, near Hebron, in Fawar, there are some 20 refugee camps. Why were they kept in refugee camps? Uh, they are Palestine, they are Palestinians. And if there is a Palestinian nation, why shouldn't the brethren absorb them in their cities? Well, how come they kept them until this very day? in refugee camps. This is something which, can, how, can you understand, how can you understand these things? Now, you can understand only if you take in, take in account the fact that they do not consider themselves as Palestinians, but different tribes. And since those in Hadera were from different tribes, different clans, they don't belong here, let them go back, and as long as they don't have they are in refugee camp. Why? Because they don't belong in, in here, because they are not, how they say in Arabic, they are not ours. You know Arabic, right? They are not from us. Okay, so this is how they view each other. So we don't buy, we don't buy uh, this issue of refugees because they made uh, the refugee the profession. And uh, we don't believe in it. We believe in solving problems rather than perpetuating problems. And they, because of their culture, because of their interests, they decided to keep their brethren, if they are brethren, in refugee camps in, to, large, to, 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 long, to long time without electricity, without running water, without sewage, without any services, marginalized and, 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 and kept in the, you know, far away from the society, only because they came from 20 kilometers to the west. And, and they're also uh, Palestinians. So uh, if this is the attitude between Arabs, it's definitely a cultural problem in the Arab world, especially when you see today what happens, how they kill each other in masses, uh, you know, in Syria. Uh, only 200,000 people were killed only because the, the, the president wants to uh, remain stuck to his chair. So, so uh, it, they, they have some problems, definitely, which came, came uh, uh, to, to, to be viewed in the refugee problems, which we uh, definitely... Uh, Look what happened to the, uh, uh, even refugees for, who came from Eastern countries. We had a president from uh, Iran. We had a, a chief of staff from Iran as well, Mofaz. Uh, we have minister, whatever, uh, people, from, you know, even the Mazkiri Stadrut was from, from Yemen one day. Uh, because they know how to fight and, and parrots and all those. Definitely, uh, uh, Jews who came from uh, Eastern communities uh, are part of the society and in a personal in a personal world I just uh, thought about this right now these are my five children 
They are nice though because of they are they are cute kids, nice kids, not because of me. Because of their mother. Uh, uh, I want to tell you something very personal. In 1975, when I knew Aina, uh, she she came on Aliyah four years er four years earlier in 1971. Uh, her parents, of course, were from here. She came. From, she was born in New York. She grew up in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. Uh, her father was born in Leipzig, in Germany. And her uh, mother was born here to a family which originally came from Russia, the Mazovetsky uh, uh, family. So uh, our kid and my, my parents came from Poland in the 30s. So we are, as we say, Ashkenazim from both sides. <laughs> uh, and my, so my kids are our, our kids. Shiri, my first uh, daughter, married a boy, got married to, the, to a boy whose mother is from Herat in Afghanistan, and his father is from Bukhara, all the way to the east. Uh, Elisheva, my fourth girl, is uh, married to a boy uh, whose mother was born in Tunisia, and uh, his, father, uh, his father was born in Marrakesh, in Morocco. Okay? This is what happened in Israel. A mixture of communities, East and West, who live together, who never know. My daughters never heard about uh, any issue about this. This is why for them it's, uh, it doesn't make any difference where the grandfather came, came from. He came from exile. We are Israelis. We shape new society, new, new mentality. We are Israelis. We are not anymore Polish, American. Afghani, Tunisian, Moroccan, or what? And, and what are the kids? If I, <laughs> what are the kids? Okay, so this is actually, uh, uh, I would say, the success of what happened with the Jewish refugees who came from all over the world, including the Eastern uh, communities. And I don't deny uh, things of uh, marginalization and uh, stereotypes which uh, prevail. You know what? In 1975, when, when I met Raina, uh, she came to us one day, and uh, she met with her mother. And she, my mother, of course, asked her where her parents from and so forth. When Raina left, my mother asked me, couldn't you find somebody normal? <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, for her, somebody normal meant poor Polish. <laughs> Nobody else. I looked at her. And I said, Ima, you know what? I tell her, you are invited to my wedding. <laughs> if you want to come, you are cordially invited. If you don't want to come, it's okay with me. This was the last time that she dared to talk about these issues. She understood. 40 years after she came to Israel, she was still hoping or talking in, 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 this, uh, in these terms. This is what I, I always say. It is hard to take Jews out of exile, but it's much harder to take exile out of the Jews. But when it succeeds, you see uh, the kids and, the, and their kids. And Baruch Hashem, we have already eight uh, grandchildren, uh, five of them from these two daughters, uh, who are happy to be Israelis and to be the fruits of the unification of communities which, were, which came from all over the world and shaped a new, a new a, a mentality of Israelis rather than Polish, Moroccans, Tunisian, Afghanis, and so forth. And if they're a success of the Zionist uh, 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 movement, it is these kids and their kids. Thank you very much. That was an inspiring and a very informative uh, dissertation on how there isn't a kind of reciprocity or equivalence between Palestinian refugees and what was going on in Israel. I'd love your comment on what you think is going on now about demands to compensate uh, Jewish refugees as 
is being now told because as the Palestinian refugee question comes to the table, there's a kind of Me Too effect that I think somehow diminishes um, the argument, but I'd love your, your insight into that because I think it could be quite damaging. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, definitely, if there is a way, if there is a way to compensate uh, uh, Jewish people who came because of their left house here or uh, a yard there or whatever, definitely the, the, if there is a way to, to go forward this and not to just, you know, to do things, just to do things. If you can really get, uh, you know, compensation to people, why not? If they have assets, if they can prove. By the way, uh, my family also had assets in Poland. And uh, if we could uh, demand it, we would uh, go and get it. Why not? If it belongs to you, it belongs to you. The question is, what do you do with the Palestinians' demands? Uh, we deny their right of return. We are willing to compensate them. And why, when you say this, you actually pull the rag under the, the right of return? Why? Uh, you might remember, in 1974, Turkey invaded Cyprus. They're still there. Occupied, occupied, occupied the northern part of the island where the Turks live, national Turks live, and established a state <coughs> illegally, without any legitimacy. No state in the world recognized the leg legitimacy of this invasion of Turkey into Cyprus. And uh, you can very easily talk about occupied territories in Cyprus when it comes to Turkey. With the years, uh, Turkey succeeded to establish a state over there. And finally, uh, some years ago, uh, there is, um, since some years ago, there is a peace agreement between the, this state, the northern uh, uh, Cyprus uh, state, which is Turkish population, and the other country to the south, which is Greek. Yes. Now, since there is peace, now you can recognize both states because they mutually recognize each other. And the both became uh, members in the European Union. Re recognize. Uh, okay. Now, uh, some thousands of people, Greeks, were expelled from two or three towns in the northern part of Cyprus on those days, 1974. You can call it ethnic cleansing. And they lived there, uh, you know, in the southern part, and they still keep the ownership documents of the houses which they have in, in, the, in that uh, part of the island. As long as there was no peace agreement, they could not go, go there because they will be killed or chased out. Now, when there is um, peace, they can demand, okay, we accept the statehood of the Turks. We, but we want to go back to live in our houses. We're a minority. We love the Turks. We, we can get along with them. We want to live in our, in our houses in the northern part of, uh, of uh, Cyprus. The northern part of Cyprus government says, no, you are Greeks. We don't want you. And we are more than willing to compensate you. We'll bring uh, somebody who will we'll, um, give assessment of how much your property belongs. Hey, 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 we, hey, uh, 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 with the value of your houses. And you'll get this, and you know what? You want more, we'll give you some uh, more 10% just to make sure that you get fair compensation. They say, no, we want the right of return. They all went, they, they took the, the northern uh, Cyprus government to court, to the European uh, Court of Human Rights. There is such a court. And they issued a uh, demand to allow them to go there. They don't want the money. They want to live in their houses. The court, after long discussions, decided that they have no right of return because these are assets. The government um, generously wants to um, compensate you. You can buy the same, build the same houses somewhere else. You don't have to necessarily go there. Take the money which they give you which they offer you, and uh, your problem is solved. You are citizens of another country. You have citizenship. You are not people without citizenship. 
you can uh, take the money and solve your problem in other place. There is no reason why to create new problem after other people live in your houses in order to solve all problem. We can solve it in another way. And the solution will come in this way. It might not be, you know, nice, but definitely this is a solution. And they deny the right of return. As, and, and they are refugees after 1974. This is a precedent. In the legal, from the legal side, it's not uh, the court of uh, some kind of repub uh, banana republic in uh, S Central uh, America. This is the European Union Court for Human Rights. This is the precedent which Israel can use, if it needed any, uh, to answer all those. We are more than willing to compensate you if you can prove uh, if you can prove uh, uh, ownership. However, I'll tell you something from my own experience. Since I speak Arabic, um, Arab media uh, keep uh, inviting me to all kinds of uh, interviews when it comes to Israel. Every uh, May 15, Arab, many Arab media outlets dedicate a day to the Palestinian refugees. This one day they give them, all the, all the rest of the year they forgot about them. <laughs> a few years ago, the BBC Arabic radio invited me to take part in a discussion about the uh, Palestinian refugees. A whole hour, or 55 minutes, between news bulletin and news bulletin. And uh, they had a guest uh, in that uh, place. They had two guests, very interesting two guests. One was the Minister of Refugees in the Palestinian uh, um, government of Abu Ala those days. And another guy was an old man from the refugee camp of Rashidiyah in southern Lebanon. <coughs> they, the, the first was the old man, and he is, you can hear he speaks without teeth. Uh, because this was how they kept them. And he claims <coughs> on air that he has Kushan means registration forms, on Nus Kibbutz Kabri, means half of Kibbutz Kabri, which is the north. Means he owns, he owned, uh, half of the lands of Kibbutz Kabri. Uh, but he doesn't want Kibbutz Kabri. I don't want. Bidi Bet I want a house in Naria. <laughs> he, he, he was not funny. He, he was all he, all he wants is 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 a housing. So the moderator tells me, "Hey, look at the bargain. You, he give, he gives up on Nus Kibbutz Gabri, and you give only on, for a price of a house. No, for a house in Aria. So what do you what do you have to say?" So I said, look, uh, I highly appreciate his generosity. <laughs> I, I didn't laugh, I, I meant it. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Israel is a Jewish state, and Jews have the right of return to the Jewish state. We are about, maybe, to establish a Palestinian state, and the uh, Palestinian state will be the place where Palestinians will go back the right of return to. We will give him money either for the Nus Kibbutz Kabri or to the house of this one, he can build a palace in the Palestinian state. This will be the solution, why not? So uh, he, he, he talks to him, hey, you have a bargain? They will give you money for, not for a house, for Nus Kibbutz Kabri, and you can build a palace in the Palestinian state. How about, what about? So this man says, La. <laughs> Alf La. Means thousand la, million la, <laughs> million. So the why? The Palestinian state, it says, will be an Arab state, and there is not even one single Arab who wants to live in the Arab states. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we. Now, you, you have to, to, to understand. The, the, the mindset of Lebanese. In Lebanon, you can say whatever you like. Because Lebanon is a free country. You can shoot everybody, you can blow up everybody. You can, you can say whatever you like. You might uh, suffer from the consequences. But this is Lebanon. Um, you know, totally free country, really. 
really free country, you can publish whatever you like, you might suffer from the consequences. He says what he thinks, and he thinks what he says. When he, say, when he sees the Arab world, he, and, and he already in his age can make fun out of everybody and can tell his listeners in Arabic, guys, you know exactly what I know. Not even one Arab wants to live in the Arab states. And you know what? Let, let me ask you something. If Canada tomorrow declares that every Arab has the right to immigrate to, to Canada, how many Arabs will come here? How many, what percentage of the Arabs will come to this country? Okay? So this is actually what he says. Our countries are destroyed. Our societies are dysfunctional. Our states are dictatorships. Who wants to live in a Palestinian state? Palestinian state? I prefer to live in, in, in Naharia under the Israeli occupation. And, okay? He prefers this. And this is actually what he says. In, in, in his uh, 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 very, uh, very uh, uh, elaborate Arabic, as he said in this, of old man who says the truth, who is not afraid of the truth, who will tell him something, who will say something. So this actually uh, is, I, I think, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Can you speak to the connection between the Mufti of Jerusalem and the Arab League with respect to the resistance of the Arab countries not allowing the Palestinians to resolve the issue? Because they're the ones who are holding the keys. Uh, it's not only the Mufti. The Mufti, by the way, as you might know, uh, the Palestinian Mufti, Haj Amin al-Husseini, took active part in the extermination of uh, the Jews of Hungary. He was a friend of Eichmann. Friend of Eichmann. Not a, look, being a friend is one thing. But going to Bosnia and to recruit 30,000 Bosnia. Bosnians Bosnia. in order to guard the bridges for the trains who took the Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz so nobody blows those bridges, this is something different than friendship with this man on, on, on different... Oh, um, okay, okay, okay. But uh, actually, if we, if we go to Palestinians and say, guys, you took part in the extermin extermination of Jews, of, of uh, what? Almost half a million Jews from Hungary. Uh, this is a, a serious thing and nobody can deny it. By the way, it, it went uh, one time in, in uh, my media appearances, in the Arab uh, media. And I said, guys, you helped the Nazis to exterminate Jews. So what did the other part, the other side, I think it was the uh, Nabil Amr, one of the leaders of the PLO, he said, yes, yes, the Mufti did it in order to prevent Jews from coming to Israel. <laughs> I'm talking about 1944, before Israel was there. <laughs> Excuse me, if they wanted to go to America or to Canada, why should they be killed? Why should they be exterminated? But if part of them would come to Israel, all of them have to go to the gas chambers. This is how they, they relate to this. Okay? This is how they justify retroactively the fact that the Hajjami had to. Look, the Arab, uh, uh, I don't say leadership, they are not leaders. They are rulers. The Arab rulers use the Palestinian refugees or those refugees who came from Palestine. Uh, as a tool to blackmail the world by showing all these things. You know how many billions were pumped to the Arab world for this? You know, the, the whole thing I didn't elaborate on UNRWA, the United Nations uh, Relief and Work Agency, which is designated only to take care of the Palestinian refugees while all the refugees all over the world are taken care of by another agency, the UNHCR, UN High Commissionary for Refugees, which are totally different rules. First of all, in those in UNHCR, you can be a refugee up to 10 years, not one day more. Because the world assumes that within 10 years, your, sol your problem will be solved, either by going back to the place which where you, you came from, or go to another place, or repatriate, being repatriated in the same place where you are. And 
you cannot, well, once you get a citizenship of any country in the world, you cease to be a refugee because you are not a refugee anymore. You are a citizen. So if after a year you got a, a citizenship of some country, then the world will not take care of you. Sec uh, third thing, you, you get a very basic, let's say, treatment and uh, uh, medical treatment to survive. They don't straighten your teeth and you don't, and they don't um, ens enhance your appearance. Even if you, if you think that you need some uh, uh, injections of Botox. <laughs> so, so, they don't do it, the world doesn't do it. But when it comes to the Palestinian refugees, everything there they get from, you know, education and schools and housing and the medical care. And according to the world, you, you, your children, if they were born uh, when, when you were refugees, they are not refugees. Because the world doesn't want to perpetuate your refugeehood by granting this uh, epithet to your children. Wait a year or two until you have children. When, you, when your problem will be solved, make as many as you want, not on the expense of the world. While the Palestinian refugees are already third and fourth generation, although they were not born in Palestine. And it will continue until the end of time. Uh, theoretically, if they remain where they are. So why should the world, and I'm talking about states, I don't know how, how much Canada takes part in this issue, but definitely the United States are paying a, a good part of the budget of UNRWA. Why the heck? Because they, they perpetuate this problem. And you know what? These Palestinian refugees, if you know what happens in those refugee camps, first of all, uh, education in these camps are about jihad, and uh, not to return to Israel, but to, to, to get rid of Israel altogether. This is, uh, uh, in short, what they are educated to. Secondly, uh, many of them uh, have no connection to Palestine, in Lebanon especially. Because of the unrest in Lebanon, many Lebanese emigrated or immigrated to the refugee camps because there, there is food for free and uh, medical care for free. And uh, this is a safe place because no wars are inside the refugee camps. While in Lebanon, Shiites kill Sunnis and the uh, Christians are fighting with the Druze and so forth. So the Palestinian refugee camps are safe haven. So many of them uh, went to the refugee camps. To, so they are actually Lebanese. So what do they? Have, where do they have the right to return to? Okay, the world pays for this because the world doesn't differentiate between this one and that one. And, 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 but the worst are in what happens in the Palestinian Authority. I'll give you a good example. There is a refugee camp named the Heisha, uh, uh, near uh, Beit Lechem. Uh, houses in the Heisha uh, are exempt, like in every other refugee camp, from uh, taxes. Because refugees can, are not supposed to pay taxes because they are refugees. So what do they do? They rent the houses to people for higher price. <laughs> and they take the money and they go rent the houses in Jerusalem. So they take money out of, uh, out of the, the houses which they don't have to pay uh, um, taxes on. So m money maker, those, those, uh, those refugee camps became. And uh, every uh, like month they get a supply of food, means sacks of sugar, rice, um, and uh, wheat and uh, gallons of oil. And it says, not to be sold, UNRWA. To, uh, so what do they do with this? They take it, they empty their sacks, and put in other sacks, and they uh, sell it in the market. Okay, who pays for this? The Americans, uh, I don't know if Canada takes part in this or not, but if, if positive, so you pay for this. So, so they can sell what they get, and uh, they laugh on everybody in the world uh, taking advantage of this thing. So, uh, definitely, as I said, they made the refugeehood into a profession, which we uh, didn't, didn't do. Okay, now you compare.